أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويقول الإنسان أإذا ما مت لسوف أخرج حيا أولا يذكر الإنسان أنا خلقناه من قبل ولم يك شيئا فوربك لنحشرنهم والشياطين ثم لنحضرنهم حول جهنم جثيا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد we were still doing uh, the concept of the hashr, of the uh, gathering and the uh, resurrection from judgment. And I had mentioned that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said hadith in Sahih Bukhari, تُحْشَرُونَ حُفَاتًا عُرَاتًا غُرْلًا That you will be resurrected uh, barefoot, naked and uncircumcised. And then he recited the verse, كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ As we created the creation, we shall recreate it. Now, the ahadith tell us, and in fact, even the Quran tells us, that some people will be resurrected in a manner that will either honor them or humiliate them. So the actual resurrection itself, when they come out of their graves, either immediately or shortly after that, things will happen to them that will either dishonor them or will raise their ranks. For example, we learn in Sahih Bukhari that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that there will be, uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran actually, that certain groups of people, يُحْشَرُونَ ala wujuhihim They're going to be resurrected on their faces. So rather than standing up, they will be upside down. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, hadith is in Bukhari, how can they be resurrected upside down? He asked the questions. He was asked the question, how can they be resurrected upside down? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, isn't the one who caused them to walk standing capable of causing them to walk on their faces? So the one who caused mankind to walk standing up can cause them to walk upside down as well. وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. These people, our scholars say, that this is the humiliation for them for refusing to bow their heads in sajda in this dunya. Because we have a rule in the sharia, al jaza'u min jins al amal, that the punishment will be in accordance with the crime. What you did, you will be punished in accordance with that. So groups of people who were too arrogant to bow their heads to Allah, they will be punished by being resurrected upside down. Now your heads are down. And Allah mentions in the Quran that on that day, يُحْشَرُونَ عَلَىٰ وُجُوهِهِمْ إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمْ They will be resurrected on their faces being dragged to Jahannam. And our Prophet ﷺ mentioned, the one who caused them to walk standing can cause them to be dragged upside down as well. In another hadith in Tirmidhi, our Prophet ﷺ said that the mutakabbirun, those that had kibr, they will be resurrected like atoms on the day of judgment. They will be resurrected with the smallest kadharra. And dharra in Arabic, of course, the modern word dharra means atom. In classical Arabic, dharra meant the smallest object imaginable. There's nothing smaller than that. So when scientists discovered the atom in the 50s, Arabs called it the dharra because in classical Arabic, dharra was the smallest concept that you can think is called dharra. And so... The Prophet ﷺ said the mutakabbirun will be resurrected like dharra on the day of judgment and people will trample over them. And they will say, who are these people that are like dharra? And it will be said to them, these were the mutakabbirun fi dunya. We said right now, al jaza'u min jins al amal. Those that felt themselves pompous, those that felt their egos to be like as big as the clouds in heavens, they will be resurrected like ants on the day of judgment. So the punishment will begin from the very time of resurrection. 
The punishment will begin from the time the graves open up and the bodies come out. Bodies will be different. Not all bodies are going to be the same. And we learn this in a number of traditions. For example, in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet wasallam said that the one who constantly asks people for no reason, مَا يَزَالُ رَجُلُ يَسْأُلُ nas, He's going to keep on asking people, give me some money, give me this, give me that. And he doesn't have a need. We're not talking about somebody who's starving. We're talking about somebody, you know, has no haya, no decency. You know, the person who has decency, even if he needs something, he feels shy to ask. And this is good. This is a sign of iman. If you have to ask, you ask, but there should be a shyness. And the one who has no haya, he just gets favors and favors and favors, and he doesn't care about paying them back. He, doesn't, he just wants to benefit from other people. So our Prophet wasallam said that a person will continue to ask people without any reason, just taking advantage of others' generosity until he will come on the day of judgment and his whole family face will be shredded not a single piece of flesh will be on it like a bare skeleton a'udhu billah why? because he had no in Arabic waj means dignity waj the waj means you are a person of dignity so he had no waj in this world he had no dignity and so on the day of judgment his dignity and in this case dignity means waj here that it will be stripped away from him and he will have nothing so our Prophet mentioned explicitly that the one who continues to ask and ask and ask, and in fact, this is mentioned in one statement of one of the Sahaba that لا يزال العبد يسأل وهو غني حتى يخلق وجهه فلا يكون عند الله وجه. A person who is rich but continues to ask people without a need, his face will be torn apart. فلا يخ حتى يخلق وجهه خلق here does not mean to create; it means to pull away, to shred. His face will be shredded. فلا يكون عند الله وجه. He will have no dignity. Waj. So waj means dignity and waj means face. So because he didn't have dignity in this dunya, on the qiyamah day, on the day of qiyamah, he shall have no dignity. And here means no waj in, uh, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is negative examples. There are positive examples as well that the bodies are not going to all be the same. And of course, the most obvious positive example, which we mentioned last class as well, is our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that the martyrs will be resurrected Erected, and their wounds and their pus will be as you see it. Its color will be the color of blood, but its smell will be the smell of musk and rih. Okay, you look at it and it looks like blood. It looks like something that is cut is there, but when you smell it, the smell will be of jannah. So it will be a badge of honor. It will be a mark of honor that this is a shaheed. All of the wounds that he had will actually be giving a type of smell, a type of positive aura that will impress the people around. And this will be a badge of honor for the uh, shaheed. And another hadith mentions, uh, كل عبد على ما مات عليه. This is a, a, a famous concept that has an element of truth to it in our traditions. Every person shall be resurrected doing what they die doing. Or one interpretation can be doing what they constantly did. So the one who constantly did dhikr, the one who constantly did some good deed, they will be resurrected and they will be doing that deed. And we seek Allah's refuge. The one who did something evil, they will be doing the mechanisms of that evil in a manner that will not be honorable. It will be dishonorable for them on the day of judgment. And we also know that the one who uh, used to uh, give the adhan, on the day of judgment, he will be giving the adhan. Or in one narration, he will have yani, atwalu anaqan, long neck. It doesn't mean he's going to be a giraffe. It means he's going to be recognized. He's going to be walking, everybody's going to be looking up to him. It's translated literally that uh, the longest necks on the day of judgment will be for the mu'adhin. It's an expression. Yani, people need to understand you don't translate expressions from one language to another. You don't say, you know, uh, he was caught with his uh, red-handed. You don't translate red-handed to another language. You have to say he was caught guilty. That's how you translate it. So in Arabic, Yani the longest necks, it means that they shall be recognized. Everybody's going to look up to them. Doesn't mean they're going to be giraffes like this. That's not something that. It, but the muadhin, 
on the day of judgment, the one who constantly gave adhan, his lifestyle was adhan, he dedicated his life to adhan, he shall be recognized for the adhan on the day of judgment and people will know that this was the mu'adhin of this dunya. So this clearly shows that not everyone shall be resurrected in the same manner. That as soon as the resurrection occurs, maybe even the bodies will transfer, maybe even the uh, clothes that are going to put on them are going to be all different in accordance with what they used to do in this dunya. So much so that some of our scholars said that the one who would uh, be drinking alcohol, he will be resurrected with the cup of alcohol in his hand, that people will see that this was a drunkard. And the one who would be doing this and that, he will be resurrected with the thing in his hand. We seek Allah's refuge. There's no explicit hadith, but people have derived this from the hadith people will be resurrected doing what they did this is a hadith so they derive from it it's not explicit that the drunkard is going to have the the uh, cup of alcohol uh, you know in there nonetheless the gen generality of the evidence says there is a basis for this now the hadith explicitly mentions people will be resurrected naked barefoot and uncircumcised there is no exception for this all people but then people will be clothed. Some people, not all. And no doubt, the righteous will be clothed. And they will be clothed in accordance with their righteousness. And the first to be clothed will be the prophets. And out of all of the prophets, our Prophet wasallam said, and hadith is in Sahih Muslim, أَنَا سَيِّدُ وَلَدِ آدَمَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ I am the Sayyid of the Walad of Adam. Sayyid here means the leader. Sayyid here means the undisputed leader. Sada Yasudu means to lead the people. Sayyid in Arabic it means the leader. Of course, in our culture it means the descendant of the Prophet, but in classical Arabic it meant the leader. Sayyid is the leader. I am the leader, the undisputed leader of all of the children of Adam on the day of judgment. Wala fakhr. And I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you because you need to know this. He, he had to say, Wala fakhr, even though we know there is no fakhr. But that is his modesty. I am the Sayyid of the children of Adam and I'm not boasting. And I am awwalu man tanshaqqu anhu al-qabr. The first that the qabr will open up and the body will come out. So the first qabr that will open after the trumpet is blown is the qabr in Medina of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first human head to come out, the first body to be resurrected will be the body of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he then says something very interesting. Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. He said, أَوَّلُ مَنْ يُكْسَى يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Ibrahim." The first to be clothed on the day of judgment is Ibrahim. Now, he is the first to come out. Now, this might be in milliseconds. We would assume no other human would see the aura of the prophets. We would assume this, right? This is an assumption that we make because the prophets are protected. So, out of all the prophets that are going to come out, instantaneously they will be clothed. And within a fraction of a millisecond, the first to be clothed, he actually said, it's not me, it is my father, Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Why? Our scholars scratched their heads over this issue and they proposed a theory, which is a theory. It makes sense, but it's just an interpretation. They say that Ibrahim alayhi salam, before he was thrown in the fire, he was humiliated by being stripped naked and paraded in front of his people as a humiliation. And so to honor him on judgment day, you know the Ibrahim story of Nimrud, right? When he was thrown in the fire. So to honor him, as we said, al jazau min jins al amal, and jaza here means the reward and the punishment will be in accordance with the effort or with the sin. So the one who was tortured in a way, the one who had to undergo suffering, their reward will be proportional and will be in the same genre as their suffering. So in this dunya, if Ibrahim السلام, was humiliated in a certain manner, Allah will honor him in the exact opposite manner. So this is an, an, a reasonable interpretation that why would Ibrahim السلام, be the first to be clothed on the day of uh, judgment. And of course, we, we said that the prophets will be rejected first and then of course uh, everybody will come after. And we also know that the jinn will be resurrected but we have no explicit 
hadith about how because we do not know the bodies of the jinns or the, 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 the essence of the jinns we don't know in any case they will obviously be resurrected because the Quran is very explicit that you will all be resurrected on the day of judgment the small controversy occurs over non I mean, non uh, 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 non humans and jinns the other animals the other species will they be resurrected or not or will only the jinn and the ins be resurrected one group of scholars said why would the animals be resurrected it doesn't make any sense to resurrect the animals however uh, this appears to be uh, an opinion that goes against explicit ayat verses in the Quran and a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah azza wa says in the Quran وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ this is hashr وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ and wuhush means wild beasts when the wild beasts will be resurrected. So even the beasts and the animals and the ants and the insects, everything that ever had a ruh will be resurrected on the day of judgment. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِدٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْهِ إِلَّا أُمَنْ أُمَمٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ ثُمَّ إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ يُحْشَرُونَ There is not a single beast on this earth Dabba is a walking beast, like a horse is a dabba, a bear is a dabba, a lion is a dabba. There is no dabba on this earth, nor even a bird in the heavens, except that they have civilizations like you. Means they have groups and species like you. We haven't left anything out of this book, and then on the day of judgment, they will all be resurrected. It's explicit in the Quran. And then on the day of judgment, ثم إلى ربهم يحشرون they will be resurrected in front of their Lord. And why will the animals be resurrected? What is the purpose of animals being resurrected? Because animals do not have heaven and hell. Animals do not have Jannah and Nar. However, our Prophet explained to us why animals will be resurrected. Because animals will be resurrected to make sure that justice is meted out even amongst the other creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. How? It's not our concern or our knowledge. But justice will be demonstrated on that day even to animals because Allah Azza wa Jal is the ultimate one who is just. And Allah does not allow zulm to happen and to go unchecked. And this should send shivers down the spine of anyone who does dhulm to any other being. If Allah will not even allow an animal to get away with injustice, how then for a human to another human? Even an animal that unjustly attacks or harms another animal on judgment day, they will have to answer to Allah and within their mechanism, we do not know how because there is no heaven and hell for the animals. There's no taklif for the animals. There's no legal responsibility. Yet somehow, justice will be meted out. How do we know this? Hadith is in Sahih Muslim that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, Wallahi, by Allah, every single creation will argue with others on the day of judgment meaning everybody will be suing everybody else that they knew to try to get good deeds right like in this society we have a free for all suing this is nothing compared to qiyamah everyone will try to get whatever they can from anyone else they're going to be so desperate until he said even two goats that butted against one another with their horns the one that had full horns and the one that didn't the one that didn't will complain that this one attacked me because it's not fair that it attacked and we're not on equal footing right this is dhulm this is dhulm now that this one attacked me and it should not have attacked me so even two goats one of them did dhulm to another now does this mean that the gazelle will complain to Allah that the lion ate it no because this is not injustice. This is not injustice. Allah Azza wa has created this mechanism and checks and balances. This is not injustice. The lion has the haq to go hunt the gazelle in the sharia of Allah Azza wa But there is dhulm that takes place even within the animal kingdom. And they know when they should and they should not do. And the Prophet gave an example. When the goat that is fully formed 
butts its, you know, its, its, its horns against the one that is not, the one that doesn't have it. This is an unfair battle now between the same species. You should not be doing that. So the one that didn't have the horns will complain to Allah that this creature, this animal was unjust to me. And Allah Azza wa Jal will deal with that on the Day of Judgment. So no injustice will go unchecked on that day, even between animals. And we also know that in the hadith it is mentioned that after the animal's hisab is done, after the animal's hisab is done, they shall then be returned to dust. Okay? So they will go back to dust. And when the kafir sees the animals dissolving and disappearing, the kafir will say, which is in the Quran, وَيَقُولُ الْكَافِرُ يَا لَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ تُرَابًا Okay, so this also shows that the animals will be resurrected because the uh, kafir, when he sees, well, these guys got out of it now. These guys don't have to worry about, about, about the punishment of Allah. How I wish that I was an animal or I was like the animals now and I could get out of it. So this clearly uh, demonstrates that the animals will also be uh, resurrected. Now we also learn that some people will be resurrected and their senses will be taken away from them. They will be deaf or they will be dumb or they will be blind or they will be all three. And this is again very explicit in the Quran. That Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran that... Uh, uh, that uh, on that day we shall resurrect them summan wa bukman wa umya. We shall resurrect them yom uh, yashurna ala wujuhihim summan bukman umya. This is Surah Isra verse 58. Surah Isra verse 98, excuse me. That on that day we shall resurrect them on their faces. Yashurna ala wujuhihim summan wa bukman wa umya. Deaf, dumb, and blind. So they will be resurrected without any faculties. And of course, in the famous uh, verse in Surah Taha, that, uh, And we shall resurrect him on the day of judgment, blind. This is on the hashr. لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا He will say, Oh Allah, I am blind now, but in this dunya I used to be seeing. Why did you take my sight away now? قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى our signs came to you and you rejected and neglected them. You saw the clear evidences for the existence of Allah. You should have worshipped Allah, but you rejected them. You didn't use your sight in this dunya. So of what use is it to you in the akhirah? Now this is not to all kafir, but some of them will be punished in this manner. Who? Allah knows best. There are groups of people that would be punished in different uh, ways. So... This is something that is again very, very explicit. Now, um, what if somebody were to say that the Quran here mentions that they're going to be deaf, dumb, and blind, and yet the Quran also mentions that they will see the fire of hell. They will see Jahannam when it comes, when it is brought out, and we're going to come to this in a few weeks, that all of mankind will see Jahannam. Okay? So how can they be blind and they are seeing there seems to be a minor contradiction. This minor contradiction, allegedly, it was first pointed out by one of the leaders of the Kharijites, Nafi ibn Azraq, who was one of the students of Ibn Abbas. And he would debate with Ibn Abbas, then he broke away from Ibn Abbas and he became one of the leaders of the, Khaz uh, of the, of the Kharijites who eventually did what they did in early Islam. So Nafi ibn Azraq, he came to Ibn Abbas with a long series of questions. And one of them was, how do I reconcile between these two verses in which one of them Allah says they will be blind and the other one Allah says they will see Jahannam. إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَ They're going to see Jahannam, right? Allah explicitly says that they're going to see Jahannam on that day. So how do we reconcile? And Ibn Abbas said, وَيْحَكَ يَبْنَ الْأَزْرَقْ Woe to you, O Ibn al-Azraq. The day of judgment is going to be a long day and there will be many stations of that day. So at one time they will not speak, at another time they will speak. At one time they will swear and deny, at another time their bodies will swear and deny, and, or, or their bodies will testify. At one time they will be blind, at another time they will see. So Ibn Abbas is saying, uh, and this is something that we're going to come to again today and, and throughout the day, that judgment day is not just a 10 minute ordeal. It will be a very, very, very long time. In fact, 
the day of judgment will feel like multiple lifetimes for large groups of people. The day of judgment will feel longer than many, many, many lifetimes of our earthly existence. It's not going to just be a one-off deal. And so Ibn Abbas is saying, the one who is going to be punished, there's going to be different types of punishment. At times, he will try to argue with Allah. At times, his mouth will be sealed and the body will testify, as the Quran mentions we're going to come to. At times, he will be blind. At times, he can see. So you are taking all of these and you're assuming it's going to happen at the same time. Another thing we learn as well is that on the day of judgment, people will somehow recognize the prophets at least if not more than the prophets. Somehow they will have a perception that even without having seen these prophets, they will know who they are. And we know this from the hadith again in Bukhari and Muslim, that on the day of judgment, people will begin to gather and they will say, what can we do? This is after a long time. Many lifetimes have gone. What can we do? Let's just move on. So they will say, let us go to Adam. And they will all go to Adam. They will know who Adam is. How? Allah will give them that perception. Then they will go to Nuh. They will go to Ibrahim. They will go to Musa. And this hadith is of course very important. And we'll have an entire lecture about this hadith when its time comes inshaAllah ta'ala. So the resurrection is going to take place. The hashir is going to happen. The gathering will come. And then the next stage is called the mawqif. The mawqif or the wuquf. The mawqif. Now somebody asked me last class, did I forget to mention the ba'ath? The word ba'ath, ba'atha. And the response is that ba'ath is a general term for the entire resurrection. It is not just one stage. Ba'ath is to come out of the graves and to be resurrected. So there is no one stage of the ba'ath. The ba'ath is overall the resurrection. As Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas, in kuntum fi raybim min al ba'athi. If you doubt the resurrection. So ba'ath is not one stage, it is overall. So the next stage, we talked about the hashr. The next stage is the land of the hashr. And in Arabic, this is called the mawqif. Where will the hashr take place? We talked about hashr means gathering. Where is the gathering? Where is the people going to be gathered to? That is the next stage we're going to come to. And that's the next 20 minutes or so. And that is called the mawqif. The mawqif is referred to explicitly in the Quran and in the Sunnah, the concept-wise. For example, Allah says in the Quran, Surah Ibrahim, verse 48, تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ On that day, the earth will be substituted for another earth, and the heavens for another heavens. So Allah is saying, the land of the mawqif is a totally different land. The land of the mawqif is not something you are familiar with. Now, some reports mention that the mawqif will take place in the valleys of Arafat. And this is, these are narrations are authentic, especially to the Sahaba, and one or two might even go back to the Prophet wasallam. How do we reconcile? Allah knows best, I have not found anybody explicitly yani, correlating, but perhaps the land of Arafat will be transformed to this new land. Because Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلْ The day that the earth shall be transformed to another earth. So there is a transformation taking place. Which means there was something in the beginning and there's something in the end. So perhaps the lands of Arafat, because we know uh, that the resurrection will occur in the plains of Arafat. That's in one narration from the Sahaba. And yet the other, as we're going to come to, the other ahadith don't mention this. So perhaps the lands and plains of Arafat will be changed to this other earth. And in the hadith in Bukhari, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Allah will roll up the earth and he shall uh, uh, roll up the heavens in his right hand. And he will say, Ana al-Malik. I am the king, where are the kings of this world? So this world and the heavens will be rolled up, which means they will be put aside. They're not going to be the next earth. What will be the earth that is the next earth? Our Prophet gave us one description, that's it. One hadith that is somewhat explicit. And hadith is in Bukhari. يُحْشَرُ النَّاسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ عَلَىٰ أَرْضٍ بَيْضَاءَ عَفْرَاءَ كَقُرْصَةٍ نَقِيِّ لَيْسَ فِيهَا مُعَلَّمٌ لِأَحَدٍ The people shall be resurrected on the day of judgment. عَلَىٰ أَرْضٍ بَيْضَاءَ 
upon a land that is pure white, afra, unblemished. It's pure whitish, without any spot on it. Like sifted wheat, wheat that has been cleaned, that has been sifted, and it is all on the ground. So perhaps a type of sparkle, perhaps a type of glitter, but it's going to be a silverish white. It will be a flat land. There's not going to be any alam, any flag, or any mountain, or any hill, or any markings that are going to tell one part from another. And some of the Sahaba described the Ard al-Mahshar as being like waraq, like silver, pure land upon which no sin has ever been committed. This is reported from some of the Sahaba uh, in the Musan of Abdul Razak. So the land of the Mahshar, the land of the Mawqif is flat. It is stretching as far as the eye can see. And wherever you see, there will be no mark, no hill, no flag, nothing to tell where you are versus where other people are. As far as the eye can see is exactly the same. So there is no way to tell where you are positioned. And this is something that is very strange for us. In fact, it hardly ever happens to any of us. Even if you are in the desert, you will see a mountain there. You will see something there to situate you. It is very, very rare for any of us to be in such a situation. Once in a while, I'll tell you, for example, in, in my own life, um, I like to go sometimes scuba diving. So I go to the ocean, deep in the oceans. And when you go to the deep of the, uh, in the oceans and you are surrounded by water as far as the eye can see, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, but you feel like, palpitation you feel like a sense of my god where am i like everything is exactly the same it's flat land and you feel like a speck of dust nowhere it's a feeling that i've experienced only on that because anywhere in this world that i have been i have never been in a place that is completely unrecognizable from point a to point b no there's always something going on something there but i can tell you from my experience in that position that you feel something weird like wow what's going on you feel lost like that so the ard al-mahshar will be flat land that's shining whitish or silverish without any marking as far as the eye can see therefore how will we find one another well our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said يَجْمَعُ اللَّهُ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ فِي صَعِيدٍ وَاحِدٍ Hadith is mutafaq alayhi. Allah will gather all of the creation in one land. Now listen to this. فَيَسْمَعُهُمُ الدَّاعِي وَيَنْفِذُهُمُ الْبَصَرِ The one who calls out will be heard by all. And the one who wants to see will be able to see all. In other words, if you want to call out to somebody, somehow your voice will reach that person. If you want to see somebody amongst hundreds of millions, not even hundreds of millions, billions and billions of people, subhanAllah, how will it happen? Allah knows. But if you want to get your haq from somebody, you will not be able to hide. يَسْمَعُهُمُ الدَّاعِي Anybody call, da'i here means anybody wants to call you. Anybody wants to call you da'wah, I want to complain against you. Anyone wants to put his lawsuit in this judgment of Allah against you, they will be able to find you. Anyone wants to see where you are, somehow you will be able to see them. This is one of the things of judgment day. So we learn therefore that on the day of judgment, the entire land will be straight and flat there will be nothing to demarcate one area from another. Yet somehow, we will be able to find those whom we want to find. How? This is something that we will not be able to understand. We also learn from the Sunnah, and the Quran references it indirectly, that the sun will come close to the day of judgment. And the creation will be in a state of anxiety and fear dealing with the terror on that day. And there are dozens of verses in the Quran, literally dozens of verses, I'm not going to go over all of them, but some of them which are especially explicit and powerful. In Surah Ibrahim, verses 42 onwards, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ Do not think 
that Allah is unaware of what the wrongdoers are doing. Don't think Allah is not aware of what is happening around the world. Don't think Allah is unaware of the ones killing and plundering and causing people's lives to be disrupted and raping and pillaging. Don't think Allah is unaware. Don't ever assume that these people will be let go. No. Allah is going to delay. Allah is going to delay them. To when? لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ To the day when the eyes will be staring in a glaze. Notice how Allah is describing. When do your eyes stare in a glaze? When you are terrified. When you're terrified, you don't blink. تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ Your eyes are out, open. Everybody is going to be staring. Everybody is going to be in a state of fear. Except for a group we will talk about next week that Allah has protected. But the default, لِيَوْمَ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ مُهْطِعِينَ مُقْنِعِي رُؤُوسِهِمْ مُهْطِعِين Their necks are outstretched. They're wondering what's happening. They're trying to look what's going to happen next. مُقْنِعِي رُؤُوسِهِمْ Their heads are raised up. لَا يَرْتَدُّ إِلَيْهِمْ طَرْفُهُمْ Their eyelids are not even blinking. وَأَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَاء And their hearts are empty in their chests. They don't feel their heart even like it's their palpitation is so much they feel empty in the heart. Notice this graphic description, the default of mankind, Allah is saying. This is how people are going to be, that the eyes are glazed, the necks are outstretched, the heads are upright, and the chests are empty. And Allah Azza wa says it also in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, verse 42, يَوْمَ إِذَنْ يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَعَصَوُ الرَّسُولَ لَوْ تُسَوَّى بِهِمُ الْأَرْضِ On that day, those who rejected the Prophet Sallallahu they would wish that the earth destroys them. They would want the earth to swallow them up. وَلَا يَكْتُمُونَ اللَّهَ حَدِيثًا And Allah will not conceal anything. And the sun will be brought close. Hadith is the famous hadith of Sahih Bukhari, Al-Mikhdad ibn Al-Aswad, that he said, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, the sun will come close to the creation on the day of judgment until it is, now this is very interesting and it's a complete coincidence, my lecture yesterday was about this issue, uh, that it will be كَمِقْدَارِ meal. It will be the distance of a meal. Remember yesterday, if those who were here, we talked about meal. This is the only hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, no sorry, there's one more, that mentions meal. But, 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 what does meal over here mean? Does it mean the Roman melia? One of the narrators of the hadith, and his name is Sulaim ibn Amir, he said, Fawallahi, I don't know what meal means. Does he mean meal like the mile of the earth? Or does he mean, now pause here, another meaning for meal in classical Arabic was, uh, you know, kuhul, you know, the kuhul that comes in the eye. So there's that uh, um, thing that you put into the bottle that is also called meal. Okay, in Arabic that is also called meal. So one of the narrators, the third narrator of the hadith, so he's coming 100 years later, he's saying, I don't know, the meal in this hadith, is it the distance that we know of as the milia, meal, or is it the meal that is the, um, the uh, what are you going to call it in English? I don't know, huh? Yeah, but in English, what are you going to call it? What's the word in English? Huh? The dip, I like this, okay, we call it the silver dip, okay? Uh, the thing you dip inside the bottle of the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, kuhul. So that is also called meal. Now, of course, meal is very small. So the Prophet is saying, he's going to be as close as the meal, or does he mean like a meal, like a mile? We don't know. Because to be fair here, the concept of meal amongst the Sahaba was is debated, do they, did they get this yet? Because that's going to come later on. So that's the whole issue. So even when the later Sahaba said, I don't know, does he mean meal a mile? Or does he mean meal this thing that you put uh, the kuhul from? But the point is, the Prophet is saying, back to the hadith, the sun will come close to mankind until it will be as close to a meal. Then people will begin to sweat in accordance with their deeds, i.e., in accordance with how pious or sinful they are, so they will feel that palpitation, the nervousness, the sweat. So the more sinful, the more 
palpitation and the more nervous. And the Prophet ﷺ said, some of them, the sweat will only go to their ankles. Others will go to their shins. Others will come to their chests. And yet others, it will drown them completely in their uh, uh, sweat. And it will come and he put his hand up to his mouth. The sweat is going to come all the way here. Now how will the sweat come from? All of this is ilm al-ghayb. Where will the water come from? All of this ilm al-ghayb. How can anybody sweat until it is? All of this, the punishments are beginning for the person on the day of judgment. My point is though that on this day, as we already mentioned, people will be resurrected in different manners and the punishment will begin. In our next lesson, inshallah, we'll also talk about the uh, safety mechanisms will also begin. Right? Allah says in the Quran, وَهُمْ مِنْ فَزَعِينَ يَوْمَئِذٍ آمِنُونَ And the righteous on that day shall be protected from the terror. This is very explicit. So that terror that will happen, if we were truly righteous, we will not face that terror. And that's going to be, we're going to mention this. Now, final point for today, inshallah ta'ala. And then we open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, final point for today. That uh, how long uh, will the day of judgment be? How long will the day of judgment be? There are three verses in the Quran that people have uh, um, kind of like found uh, any problematic in their interpretation. The first verse, Surah Al-Hajj, verse 47. Surah Al-Hajj, verse 47. وَإِنَّ يَوْمًا عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ كَأَلْفِ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ And the day in the sight of your Lord is like a thousand years of your reckoning. So what this verse is saying is that obviously for Allah, time is not like it is for us. And that's obvious. Our concept of time is different. Allah created time. Time is a creation of Allah, by the way. Time is makhluq. And one of the ajaib of the makhluqat that our minds cannot fully understand and comprehend. And so Allah is saying, very clearly we understand that point, that for Allah, time is different than for what you is. A day in the eyes of Allah is like a thousand of your years, meaning time is different for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is understood. This verse actually has nothing to do with qiyamah. So that's not any problematic issue. The other two verses seem to give two different time frames for the day of judgment. That's why it becomes problematic. So the first verse, Surah Ma'arij, verse 4. تَعْرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةً The angels will come up to him and Jibreel as well in or on a day that shall be as long as 50,000 years. This is Surah Ma'arij verse 4. So 50,000 years. And then Surah Sajda verse 5. يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ يَعْرُجُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ That he is the one who controls uh, and monitors what happens in the heavens and the earth. And then, يَعْرُجُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ And then the, there shall be an ascent on the day that will be a thousand years of your reckoning. يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ Now, here is where the question marks arise. One verse says 50,000. One verse says 1,000. Do both of these verses apply to the day of judgment? Frankly, we do not know. Ibn Abbas himself was asked about these two verses. And he said, لا أدري. I don't know. Two days that Allah has mentioned in the Quran, and I believe in both of them. Are they the same? Are they different? La adri. Because the verses don't explicitly say that it is the day of judgment. Yes, the context seems to suggest it. That is true. But it is not explicit. It could be that Allah is simply talking about this is how long it takes the angels to come up in your time frame. Right? That the angels take this long <clears throat> to come up according to your time frame. Others have said that the day of judgment will be 1,000 years of your time frame. So this one is very explicit because Allah says, Mimma ta'uddun. Mimma ta'uddun means what you are accustomed to. So others have said the day of judgment will be 1,000 years long. Think about that. Our average lifespan 
that we are actually physically awake is around 40, 50 years awake. Lifespan is 70, 80, but in terms of activity, 40, 50 years we're awake. The day of judgment will be multiple, multiple, multiple lifetimes. But it will feel like 50,000 years. So, 1,000 actual years, and it will feel like 50,000 years. So there's one interpretation. Another interpretation, I think number three now, that it will be 1,000 for one group of people and up to 50,000 for another group of people and people in between as well. So for some people, the day of judgment will be like 1,000 years and for others, 10,000, for others, 30, up until 50,000 years. This is another interpretation. Yet another interpretation is that the thousand year reference is not about day of judgment. It is about the length of time that it takes for the malaika to go up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the day of judgment will be 50,000 years. So the two verses don't apply to the judgment day. One of them does, the other one does not. In the end of the day, frankly, I don't know what, what to say about this. If Ibn Abbas said, لا أدري, then I follow Ibn Abbas, لا أدري. I don't know. Are both of these verses about the Day of Judgment or is one about the Day of Judgment and one about the creation or is it perception that some feel 1,000, some feel 50,000? I don't know. لا أدري. It is in the Quran and we believe in it. And uh, we conclude by stating that there is clearly some evidence to indicate relativity of Judgment Day. There is clearly evidence to indicate that some people will feel judgment is quicker than others. And of them, Allah says in the Quran, وَكَانَ يَوْمًا عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ عَسِيرًا The day of judgment will be a very difficult day for the kafir. And in another verse, فَذَلِكَ يَوْمٌ عَسِيرٌ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ غَيْرُ يَسِيرٌ That is a very difficult day. It will not be easy for the kafir. Now, Allah is saying it won't be easy for the kafir. What is the implication? It will be easy for the believer. Because if it would be difficult for the believer, why would Allah specify? This is called mafhum al-mukhalifa, the derived meaning. Okay? Allah doesn't in this verse explicitly say it will be easy for the Muslim. But by specifying it will be difficult for the kafir, the implied derived meaning is that it will be easy for the kafir. And the hadith in Mustad Imam Ahmad, which is one that we should look forward to and try our best to be amongst those people. May Allah make us amongst those people. Our Prophet Sallallahu said, I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul, the day of judgment will be easier for the believer, so much so that it will be lighter for him. Yani akhaf means akhaf means quicker for him than the obligatory prayers that he would pray in this dunya. The fard salah, four rak'ah. How much do we take? Five minutes? Seven minutes? It will be easier for him than the fard salah. This hadith is Musnad Ibn Ahmad. So for the righteous believer, day of judgment is just formalities. He'll feel. It might be a thousand years. But Allah Azza wa Jal will allow the believer to zoom through that. This is for the ultimate. And some of the uh, Sahaba have said, in fact, this is a hadith that scholars have differed. Is it an authentic hadith or is it something the Sahaba said? So, but it is mentioned in the books uh, of Athar that for the mu'min, qiyamah will be like between dhuhr and asr and in one version between asr and maghrib. So dhuhr and asr, two, three hours, asr and maghrib, an hour, hour and a half. Something quick. So for the believer, the judgment day will be a quick day. But there is one evidence that does seem to suggest the 50,000 does apply to the Day of Judgment, and that's the final thing that we'll say, inshallah ta'ala, and that is the hadith that is in Bukhari and Muslim. And that is that Abu Huraira narrated that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that anyone who owns gold or silver and does not pay zakat on it, that zakat will be turned into a fire that will you be used to burn him and his body on his face and his sides then he said fi yawmin kana miqdaruhu 50000 sana in a day that shall stretch to 50000 years 
then he will see whether he's going to heaven or hell. So this hadith is very explicit that the maximum amount of time for the day of judgment, whether it is real or whether it is perception, is the same thing. Because if you think it's that long, then you're feeling it to be that long. It is 50,000 years. So Allah knows best. Perhaps we can conclude that uh, the day of judgment, that the day of judgment will maximum be felt for 50,000 years. Now think about 50,000 years. That is an eternal lifetime. And that's why when we begin our next lesson, inshallah, we'll begin from this point. People will become so exasperated that they will even be willing, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, to go on to Jahannam so that judgment day will finish. How could you get to that level only if 50,000 years have gone on? So the day of judgment itself is not a quick thing for the kafir. But for the believer, and so another reason for us to be righteous and pious, for the believer, it will be something quick and easy. And that is our goal. We will continue next week, inshallah. Let me do some questions. See, these are questions online that uh, we have that... Um, when we say that the Prophet is the Sayyid of the children of Adam, does this mean that Adam has a separate maqam and he is not the Sayyid of his father Adam because he said, because he said, Walid Adam? No. What children of Adam here means is mankind. When the Prophet is saying, I am the Sayyid of the children of Adam, what he means is mankind. We'll, we'll be resurrected from the same graves and the same locations we will be buried in. We will be resurrected with the people that are buried next to us. Again, this is a question that we do not have any answers for. The life of the Barzakh is something that is totally different from our own life. We do not know whether the people buried physically with us will be resurrected with us. Allah knows best. Any questions from one of the brothers here? Yes, Bismillah. No, 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 no. So this is a very good question, and I should have mentioned this. Very good question. Let me rephrase it slightly. Isn't the Ard al-Mahshar Ard of Palestine? Many, many months ago, we talked about the signs of Judgment Day, and I mentioned that Bilad al-Sham is Ard al-Mahshar. Okay? So now you are correct in saying, but hold on a second, that's Ard al-Mahshar. Okay, this is the Mahshar of this dunya, or Bilad al-Sham. My lecture today was about the mahshar of the akhirah. Two different mahshars. There will be, what does hashar mean, guys? Hashar means what? Gathering. gathering. There will be the final gathering of mankind in this dunya. The final gathering of mankind. Yes. Yes. This is of this dunya. Will be the other mahshar in Bilad al-Sham. That will be the final bastion of mankind. It's called Ard al-Mahshar because that's going to be the last stand. But it is of this dunya where people are still here eating and drinking and breathing. They're not dead. This is this dunya. That has nothing to do with our talk today. Our talk today is about after the trumpet whereas what you asked is before the trumpet. The issue of Arafat being uh, Ard al-Mahshar it is reported from Ibn Abbas and inshallah, let me bring for you the exact narrations then for next time. We should bring it up. When we're being this academic, I shouldn't just mention it from the top of my head. I should bring it, so I will bring it. But it is mentioned, in, and so and when, when a sahabi says something that is from ilm al-ghayb, so then we assume that it is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. No sahabi can say that Arafat is going to be uh, that without something from the Prophet ﷺ. Sisters, any questions? Yes, in the back, sister, go ahead. Every single creature, every single human, born as a child or adult, doesn't matter. They shall be resurrected on Qiyamah. But that doesn't mean that they will have to suffer on Qiyamah. So they will be resurrected on Qiyamah and they will be in Mahshar. And we know this because in the hadith in uh, Muslim Imam Ahmad, our Prophet ﷺ said that the one who loses a child uh, and is patient at that, that Allah will say to the child, on the day of judgment, enter Jannah. And the child will say, no, not without my parents. And so the child will hold on to the parents' hands 
and the child will make shafa'ah for the parents who were sabir and muhtasib and, the, and they will be given shafa'ah. Where is this taking place? Mahshar. Where is this whole thing taking place? Mahshar. So the child is there. The child has been resurrected. The child is there and being told, okay, you don't have any hisab, you can go. But that's on the mahshar. So children will also be resurrected. But it doesn't mean that they will necessarily go through all of these uh, same stages. And inshallah with this we conclude for today. And I will see you inshallah uh, on Saturday for our big conference inshallah. And then inshallah next week inshallah. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال